name is Heather Kreiser. So thankful to be here with you this morning. We last week started a series called Emotionally Healthy Lives. And uh, Jeff started out with talking about identity and how important it is for us to understand the fact that we are each unique, unrepeatable, created in the image of God with divine purpose. And we are treasured by God. And that's a, a really important way to start this journey with understanding emotionally healthy spirituality. And as we journey on this, we are really striving for this high, high goal of becoming a healthy, reasonably functional family here at Mountain Brook. <laughs> we just love that because it's so doable, right? We can pursue health. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to be reasonably functional as we get to know each other, as we walk this journey together. I encourage you, if you missed uh, the message from last week, to listen to that. It's, it's kind of building upon each week as we go through this book. Um, really, the scripture is our base, but this book has some really phenomenal biblical principles about pursuing emotional health. Today, we're going to be sharing about um, this idea of going back before we can go forward. And I was originally thinking about this message being titled Family Business because we all have some business to do when it comes to understanding our own family backgrounds and how to more healthfully engage within our current families and with our church family. Um, you know, when I think about, I'm going to share a scripture and then we're going to talk about a little bit about what, do, what comes to mind when we think about a happy, functional family. But our core passage today is from Exodus 20, 3 through 6. And if you could just pay special attention to how generations are impacted by parents' decisions specifically, I'll read this. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the image of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. If you could just pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you're a good God, that you're a great father. We thank you that you limit the um, destruction of, of sin and decisions in the past, and you extend your blessing throughout many more generations. And we invite you to come, Holy Spirit, and awaken us to the reality of um, what has gone on in our past so that we can experience and walk in true freedom this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I don't know what you think about when you think about a happy, reasonably functional family. I have one photo here that comes to mind for me. It's a bright, sunny day. You've got laughter, togetherness. It's just beautiful. Green trees, everything's great. And then I saw this other photo. I'm like, what is going on here? I have no idea. Is this supposed to be a happy family? It looks super uncomfortable. I don't know. It looks super fake. But, you know, sometimes we have these images of what a happy family should look like. Um, more often than not, this can be the scene that we have on our way to church. <laughs> Who's not experienced that? Or on the way out? That's even worse. You're like, I heard this great message, and then you get this huge fight in the car on the way out. Um, and, but some of us can't even fathom, we can't even imagine what it would be like to be a part of this fun healthy family, and it's as elusive as maybe this. <laughs> um, you know, it's weird to think about all the images of what it should look like and what it should feel like, but God has designed us to experience health and wholeness, and he's given us power through his spirit. He's given us truth through his word to experience individually and together. And this next photo is of Jeff and I on our wedding day. And man, this is actually in San Luis Obispo. It's crazy. Um, you know, yeah, we look a little different. Jeff has so much hair then, <laughs> so much hair. I still have the same amount of hair. But, um, you know, we were, we were so, um, we were just so idealistic 
we wanted to have the best marriage in the world. I mean, we had our issues, sure, but we had Jesus and passion and determination. I mean, what could stop us? We were so naive, but we're cute. We're super cute. Um, yeah, so some of us have had, you know, more health than unhealth in our upbringing and in our family. You can take that picture off. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, we have been married a long time. Um, and I just, to, to Jeff's point in, in capturing the moment earlier, you know, there is so much to celebrate. There is health, there is beauty that many of us have gleaned from our parents and grandparents, and we celebrate that. And all of us want the best for the people that we live and do life with. We want the best for those of us who have children. No one wants to pass down struggles or issues from our family's past. But sadly, few of us are even aware of what's keeping us from the freedom and health that God has for us and that Jesus has already paid for. You know, self-awareness is pretty key in our process of authentic maturity. Um, many Christians, many of us, have learned to say and do the right things because it's been expected of us. Um, but generational strongholds are real, and patterns continue to create struggle in our journey with Jesus and with our relationships primarily because deep transformation has not really taken hold. We live life the way we should, but when crisis comes, we revert to that kind of hardwired sin and unhealthy behaviors from our upbringing. So today, we are gonna be talking about not only self-awareness, but Jesus awareness. He brings true and lasting transformation. It's beyond getting a self-help book, and I really want to communicate that this morning. You know, we're not, we're not promoting this book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, as the key. It is one of many parts of tools, many tools that God has given us, because he desires and longs for us to have freedom and walk in freedom daily. And the truth is this, as a believer in Jesus, you have been adopted into God's family and you have supernatural power to walk in freedom away from that gravitational pull of generational strongholds. You know, sometimes we're not aware of the smells in our own environment. Have you ever noticed that? Maybe you go into um, someone's home and you're like, this is, wow, I love that, that candle fragrance. Or, or maybe they had just cooked something and they have no idea how pungent it is through the house. You're like, wow, that's crazy. Um, this last week I went to one of our favorite uh, Mexican food restaurants and, oh man, we had such a great time. We hung out with family and had chips and salsa galore. And um, I just worn this shirt that evening and I had planned because I had packed just limited clothes to wear that same shirt in the next morning. And I woke up and I got hungry because it smelled like chips and salsa. It just smelled, it just, it, and I didn't spill anything on it. It was a white shirt. It looked fine, but it smelled like the restaurant. And I think about that, you know, how often we are trying to calibrate what normal and what health is. And if we try to create the standard of health and normal, it's going to be off base from what God has for us. We grew up in a certain smell. We grew up in a certain kind of normal. And apart from Jesus making us aware of some of those things in our own heart and making us aware of his power and his presence, we're going to continue smelling <laughs> the whole rest of our life. We need him and we need awakening. Um, in this book, chapter three, um, I just wanted to quote a couple of points that are important. And it's based on that passage in Exodus that we shared. Number one, the blessings and sins of our families going back two to three generations profoundly impact who we are today. And number two, discipleship requires putting off the sinful patterns of our family of origin and relearning how to do God, life God's way in God's family, yeah. right? Yes. And that's what we're doing together. I think that's another message that um, has been loud and clear to Jeff and myself to our staff as we are meeting and going through this material, 
that we're not alone. You're not alone. You will never be alone again. It is so powerful. I feel like that's actually one of a, a, a primary fear that we have. We have a lot of fears, two that we're born with, and everything else is learned. The fear of loud noises and the fear of the dark are fears that we're born with, but any other fear we actually have to learn. So guess what? We can unlearn those in the same way, right? Through the power of Jesus. So again, our big idea this morning is, as a believer in Jesus, you have been adopted into God's family. You have supernatural power to walk in freedom away from that gravitational pull of generational strongholds. Um, I don't know if you've heard this, but the Iroquois um, tribe is known for their wisdom and decision-making. I find it breathtaking that the elders take into consideration, for every major decision, they take into consideration not only their children and their grandchildren and the impacts of that decision, but down through seven generations. Is that amazing? Think about one decision you've made that's thought of anything beyond, <laughs> like tomorrow. No, but any, any kind of um, impact, um, the kind of the way we spend our finances, um, the kind of um, the, ki- the way we treat our environment, you know, any of those things, are we taking into consideration individually as a church, as a county or city government or national government, anything really beyond the next election cycle, but this is the heart of our God. He knows that the decisions that we make impact not just tomorrow, but future generations. So what does it mean for us to do this work that the book talks about, to go backwards in order to go forwards? And I just have to say it, this is not an opportunity to blame all your stuff on your parents, <laughs> especially under 30, because I have three boys. You cannot blame online. <laughs> you cannot blame your parents for all your stuff. <laughs> yes, there is a lot that comes from our upbringing, but this is more an opportunity for each of us to take responsibility for this empowerment we have in Jesus to walk out from underneath this weight. We also aren't doing this to dig up stuff that isn't meant to be dug up. Many of you have done some of the hard work. You have forgiven people that have done things that have been um, unkind or unhealthy or traumatic. You have maybe forgiven people who have not given you the things you've needed. There's a big um, neuroscience that's going, um, that's expanding right now, that's phenomenal. And one of these, principles is that Jesus, that God created us, formed us to live from a place of joy, and that trauma happens in life, and we lose our path back to joy. And a lot of this does happen through generational curses. Now, there's specific sins and strongholds, and we'll talk about that. But the most important thing is to know that we have the good news and being Jesus aware is that he's already broken these generational strongholds. In Isaiah 53, five through six, it says, referring to Jesus as a prophetic um, passage here, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, my own experience is that the Lord has freed me from so many unhealthy family patterns. Um, Some of my healing has come through just one encounter of worship, and others has um, taken months of counseling and prayer ministry. But I embrace this reality that as one who's been adopted into this family of God, that I have supernatural power to walk in freedom and away from that gravitational pull of generational strongholds. So some sins and deeply ingrained lies have existed throughout these generations, maybe 20, 40, or 60 years. And often when we become aware of this stuff, we just want it to go like that. 
Like, it's taken a long time to build its way into our family line. So we have to know that there's going to be some work associated with this. We've got to put our shoulder to the plow here a little bit. We invite this work of the Holy Spirit, but we also need to partner with God in this. We start, um, and, and actually, before we partner, we even just need to acknowledge and declare that finished work of the cross, right? We can declare that when we're feeling overwhelmed and we don't even know how to identify this pattern, this fear, this anxiety that's gripped us in a particular morning or day or evening or in the middle of the night. We, in that moment, don't need to go through a lot of psychoanalysis. We can just literally declare, Jesus, Thank you for that you have paid for this on the cross. That I don't need to live under this. We, uh, we just, and you can declare it out loud. I reject this anxiety. I reject this fear in the name of Jesus, and I receive the peace of Christ. And he will do a longer healing. He will get you connected. And that's one huge, huge dream and goal of Jeff's and mine is to create a resource list of trusted partners that are counselors and prayer ministry that can really help each of us in this longer journey. So we acknowledge it. We acknowledge that there is stuff in the back in the back in order to move forward. And we acknowledge that it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. I love this passage. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Right? So there's that partnership. We acknowledge the freedom but we also don't let ourselves be burdened by that yoke of slavery. And so this other question that I brought up, what or who are we partnering with? Am I partnering with God's truth or am I on autopilot allowing myself to respond the way maybe I've learned to respond in the past or generations have responded? When things get really hard, do I go to that second or third glass of wine? When things get super difficult, what am I looking at on the computer? What is my go-to? I mean, really what that is, when we think about it and we, we compare it to Exodus and has, um, where God demands that we would have no other God before him, it's idolatry. When I go to other stuff out of comfort and out of need and out to get out from underneath the overwhelming sense of anxiety or fear because of something that's triggered that or because of decisions I've made to get myself in there, that's idolatry. We need to be recreating a pattern to go to God and to invite other people into our process. <laughs> um, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven: 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. I, I, used to read that passage and just get kind of like full of guilt and like performance anxiety. I mean, like, what does it mean to love God like that? Like, that's big kind of love. I don't have that naturally. But this last week, as I was um, putting that in context with our, our message this morning, it's to love him out of my will. It's to love him out of an action and a pur pur purpose. It's to be deliberate and intentional and say, I am going to love my God with my mind right now. I may not feel a lot of love and warmth in the moment, but I am going to activate the love that I have because of the Holy Spirit back toward him. This really, Jesus is a disruptor. I love Jesus. I love Jesus because he doesn't just disrupt our current day. He doesn't just disrupt and create a new destiny, but his, the blood of Jesus goes all the way back, all the way back. That red thread of his blood disrupts our generations in the past. Those patterns of divorce, the patterns of suicide, the patterns of um, emotionally disconnecting when things get difficult. We've already talked about addictions. Jesus disrupts it. So how, um, you know, how, what does this mean on a day-to-day -day life? It's great to know that truth. This is the hard work. This is the good work that we get to do together. 
Um, I think about this last week, Jeff had mentioned it. I really appreciated that capture the moment to be able to focus on, you know, the fact that some of us are living in a sweet moment of experiencing hope. Um, and I did not have that kind of week this last week. <laughs> Darn it. I couldn't raise my hand. Um, it was really, uh, it was really tough. It was heavy for a lot of reasons. And uh, my emotions just got the best of me. I felt like did we have a couple of days of fog here? Was it just the fog? Yeah, we did. Oh, we had rain. Like it was overcast, wet. And that, it was on Tuesday, I think, because my emotions reflected that. I just felt that. And I have learned over the years that I kind of like pity parties. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. I sometimes I feel like I'm like, you know what? I'm doing a pretty darn good job keeping a happy face. I'm just going to sit in this a little bit. I'm just going to let this kind of take over. And I, I don't know why. It's never a good idea. Um, and I had to purposefully invite Jesus into that moment of heaviness. And he has created, thankfully, new and faster exits for me off of that pity party road. <laughs> right? No, that's so good. It's good to celebrate those little wins. Um, and I realize that because of Jesus, his, I'm more Jesus aware in the moment that I'm overcome by um, the situation at hand. And he's bigger I can literally place my hope. My feelings may not change, but my perspective is changing. And, well, let's talk about this. As a church family, we will continue this process to walk out from underneath the weight of our past and into the freedom that is ours in Christ. How are we going to do that? There are three things. Um, the first is that we're part of a family. I mentioned that we're not alone. We're never, ever going to be alone because we have the Holy Spirit residing with us, in us. And apart from that, he's given us people. And it's a family. And it may not be your blood family. You may not have a ton of people. I see some families that are together. It's awesome. By the way, total parentheses here, my entire family was at Disneyland this last weekend without me. Jeff and I had to do some things, and I was like, it was so hard to not be with them. I love being with my family, and yet God has expanded my family. This is my family. This is our family. We are each other's family, and again, it's one thing to say it, but it's a whole nother thing to be putting that into practice, and huge on our vision and heart for Mountain Brook as we turn into 2022 is creating communities for every person that calls Mountain Brook your home. Men's, women's, youth, you could be part of the host team out there. That's literally a family. We're praying for each other. We're praying for our community. Um, it's gonna be working through stuff of the, of the past, addictions. Um, there will be, again, we're not gonna be a come one, come all thing. We're gonna be organic in it. Whoever God has created within our family as leaders for those groups, that's what will be represented here. But we won't be walking this alone. And this is not a one Sunday thing either. Overcoming generational um, obstacles and sins is a process, right? And so there will be many opportunities to work this stuff out in community. And, and you know, I think with that too, the goal of emotional, healthy spirituality, really all it is is discipleship. That's all it is. This, it's this journey of saying, how do I align my life with the calling of Jesus? That he has a calling and a purpose for each of us. And that's what this, this idea is. Um, we're moving, we're going to be moving away from this, like, really, what do I call it? It's an extreme Put it like crushing independence. Like, I feel like that's one option that I have picked in the past is just this, this total extreme of independence where I don't want to merge my stuff with other people. I want to just try to figure it out with Jesus on my own. <laughs> that's just not how he's designed us. Or we go the other extreme of codependency and I literally throw my stuff onto people and have them deal with it. Neither of those are healthy extremes, but interdependency is what God is calling us to do. Um, the second way that we're going to walk out into freedom as a church family is 
the primacy of God's word. We need God's word. We need to intent, intentionally, like I mentioned before, replace lies with truth. And that will be the very basis for all of these communities that I mentioned. And how do we do this? I think one of the biggest keys, if I could leave a couple of things with you today, online, outside, together here, is becoming aware of a lie is a work of the Holy Spirit, right? I don't know I'm believing a lie. I'm just kind of cruising along in this life that I'm trying to manage on my own. If it feels good, if it looks right, I'm running after that. But with God as the director of my life, he can literally awaken me to when I'm believing a lie. And by studying God's word, we can just juxtapose it. We can just compare it. We can just align it right up with whatever belief system I'm putting into play at that moment. And is that true or is it not? And even if it feels really true, but it doesn't line up with scripture, what are we going to do? Are we going to go with what we feel and what's been more comfortable and has been a pattern? Or are we going to be courageous to say, God, your word declares the truth over my life. And I'm running toward that, even though it's uncomfortable. And you're going to be with a group of people that are going to doing that with you. And the third thing that's so important that we need, we need God's family, I mentioned. We need the primacy, the, the totality and the power of God's word. And we need his Holy Spirit, Right? We need his spirit. We need his power. We need his partnership to walk out from underneath these things. Um, we're we're going to have a ministry time actually together. That's really a part of um, our heritage as a, a Vineyard USA church. We um, don't only talk from up front. We don't only get to experience worship together as a family, but we get to respond, right? Who wants to leave here the same this morning? I mean, you guys invested a good chunk of time. <laughs> we want to leave changed. And um, so I'm going to invite Ben, if he could come up and um, just get on that guitar. And, and we're going to create a space here. If you need to leave, um, you're f welcome to do that. We have kids, obviously, that, that will need to be picked up. Um, but we want to create a space to target a couple of these biggies um, when we talk about generational sin. Uh, I came from a divorced family, and I didn't realize how, um, like you think, half of America, half of whatever, um, your family and friends are divorced. It shouldn't be a big deal, but it is a big deal. It leaves earthquakes in our life, and oftentimes we just, it just goes unnoticed or unseen or pushed push back. And um, I remember a specific time where um, my parents, they were great, loving people. Mom, you might be watching. Um, but we all have, again, our issues. And as I came to Christ, began walking this journey of healing, um, I then bumped into a really tough time in a church family. And I felt rejected. And I felt like, wait, my parents can divorce me. But I felt like the church had divorced me in some way. I was being super dramatic, but it was what it felt like, right? And how many of us have experienced church hurt? I mean, let's just say if you haven't, you will. I'm sorry. It's just because it's people hurt, right? It's the fact is we are um, imperfect people. But through that process of healing, Jesus never divorced me. Jesus never left me, and that to be awakened to that reality was a strength that I could bring into any future issues that I had with that. So that's heavy on my mind, um, is people who are still struggling with some of the pain, maybe it's your own divorce, or it's um, a divorce that you came out of as um, a child. And then Jeff, I'm gonna invite you as well. If there's any um, things that are on your heart or mind for our group here or for online, we invite you just, I'm gonna pray in a minute to do one of two things. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you've not yet. 
And then this other idea of taking this time to start your journey, if you have not, to say no to the power of those generational um, obstacles, those generational strongholds, and say yes to the freedom that God has for you. Yeah. Let's pray. Yeah, Lord, we, we thank you. Just as a spiritual mom this morning, God, I thank you for the freedom that you have available and accessible to every single person here. Yes, Lord. I thank you that you have given us self-awareness, but more that you've given us Jesus awareness. So help us, God, this morning to take a tiny step or a big step toward inviting and um, activating the freedom, Jesus, that you have purchased for us. Yeah. Yeah, that there would be people this morning that would literally leave at the altar, leave at the front of this church what they came in with that has cast a shadow on their life or relationships or their finances or their health. Yeah, Yeah, we ask Holy Spirit that you would do what's on your heart already to do and that we would just partner with you. Yeah, that it's on your heart to bring an end to those overwhelming anxieties, to overwhelming fears. Yeah, and you'll begin with you.